All right. Uh, so listen, if you would this morning, turn in your Bibles to Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 8 is where we're going to start uh, this morning. Um, we're going to be in, uh, in, a, in, in, in actually three different books in the Bible this morning. So there's going to be some turning back and forth this morning. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and give you all... Uh, all the, the passages that we're going to look at today, we're going to look at Romans 8, uh, verse 23, uh, then Romans uh, 5, verse 8, and then we're going to look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, um, and then also the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 1, verse 12. And um, I know it's sometimes hard to turn or, turn or, uh, in your Bibles and keep up with me as I'm, as I'm throwing you know, a number of different scriptures out at you, so we are going to have it up here on the screen as well for you to follow along. Uh, but while you're turning there, I want to ask you a quick question. How many of you have planned a, a road trip as of recent, of maybe a, a recent vacation? Anybody? I know it's summertime. That's this is typically the time we take vacations, right? There's a few hands that I see here. You know, when uh, Nikki and I, it's been a little while. I think it was last year when we actually took somewhat of a vacation, but it's been a little while for us. Uh, but, you know, typically when we plan out our vacation. We we sit down together and we and we put we, we, we take into consideration certain things. And you know the first thing that we take a look at is we we did we decide on the destination where we're gonna go. All right, where we're gonna spend our vacation at. And I mean you know, we don't typically just get on the road, take off, and where we end up, we end up. I know the Frasers do that. <laughs> so but <laughs> I don't know, right, right. I was thinking of him the whole time I was, you know, preparing this. I know Darren, man, he's like, hey, it don't matter wherever we, where we end up, man, that's where we'll go, you know. But, you know, typically, right, <laughs> typically for my family and I, Nikki and I, we sit down and we determine the destination where we're going to go. That's usually step one. Uh, step two is we count the cost. I mean, we figure out, man, we try to put a budget together. We don't want to get halfway there, you know, and realize that we don't have enough finances to get to our destination and have to turn around and come back or, you know, or even worse yet, get there, run out of money, and then we're stranded. You know, that would be a cat catastrophe, right? So we typically try to plan it out and plan out our cost, you know, what it's going to cost us. And the next thing we do is we sit down and we map it out. I, I can remember as a child, my parents, you know, when we were getting ready to take vacation, they would roll out this map, you know, of, of the whole United States. And then they would take and they would highlight the roads that, and highways and places that they were going to, uh, you know, the, the direction that they were going to take to get where we were going. And I know today it's a little bit different for us. We just pull out Google Maps. We put in the, the, uh, we put in the address and we just follow Google Maps to get there, right? But typically we still look and say, listen... Right. We want, this is how we want to get there, or the places that we want to go in, on the way. Um, and so we need a map for that. Right. We need something to follow. And the fourth thing that, uh, that we do is we plan our stops. And, you know, we try to plan our stops, but there's also some stops that are unplanned. Right. I mean, you always have some stops to make that, man, you weren't planning on making. Uh, but we try to plan our stops. So, in, you know, to get the most benefit out of our travel and. Um, you know, we try to make every stop count. I can remember telling my children, you know, listen, we're stopping at this next store and I want all of y'all to get out and I want all of y'all to go to the restroom. OK, I don't care if you have to go or not. We're not making another stop from here. Right. Yeah. Didn't always work out. <laughs> Very seldom did that work out. We usually were stopping shortly after that. But, you know, that was our plan. You know, our plan was to make the most of every stop that we made. Um, and then, of course, the last thing is, you know, the last step of our vacation is arriving where we're going, man, and then taking that time to enjoy uh, that time spent, you know, on that vacation. And, and I don't know if you know where I'm going with this, but, you know, we, as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, we too are on a journey, all right? You and I are on a journey together with God. And, you know, there are certain things, steps along the way that, that have to take place in order for us to to truly grow in our faith and our relationship and to come closer and nearer to God. So, you know, for the next few weeks, what I want to do is I want to talk about this journey that you and I are on, okay? So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at that first step, okay? And that first step is deciding on the destination. Uh, the Word of God is clear. There's but one or two places that when we draw our last breath here on this earth that we're going to end up, okay? Okay. No, we're either going to be eternally in God's presence or we're going to be eternally separated for God, from God in hell. Now, I know that we don't talk a lot about hell in churches these days. But church, listen, I, did you know that Jesus had more to say about hell than he did about heaven in the Gospels? 
But listen, we need to, we need to choose our destination. Where are we going to go? And I'm a firm believer in free will. I heard a pastor say just the other day that, you know, that, that God doesn't send people to hell. We choose it. Because He's provided every access necessary for us to gain the kingdom of God, to be eternally in God's presence. He's done it all. So listen, today, what I want to talk to you about, church, is I want to talk to you about salvation. And, you know, there's, there's three different types of people that this may minister to. Some of you, some may, you may be born again believers in Christ, so this may sound a little bit redundant to you. Maybe you already know the plan of salvation, and, and you know, and this is nothing new to you. But what I want to encourage you, don't, don't harden your, don't close your ears to it, okay? Because God may speak and minister something to your heart today through His Word that, you know, that maybe you haven't heard before, okay? And the second type of person, this, the, for the second type of person, this may step on somebody's toes today. But can I tell you that it's okay because sometimes God needs to step on our toes to, to get our attention. And it may step on your toes because you have this idea of what it is to be saved and the process of receiving salvation, but yet that thought, that mindset that you have, you may see today that it doesn't line up exactly with the plan of God and what the scripture says about receiving salvation. And for the third person, it may be some you somebody may be here today and you never heard the plan of salvation, what God's plan of redemption is. And this may be your first time hearing this. Well, church, I want to encourage you, no matter what position you find yourself in here today, I encourage you to open your hearts to God, to be attentive and, and let God speak to you this morning, okay? So listen, the first thing that we need to understand about, about salvation, we, the first thing that we need to understand is we need to understand our position with God apart from Christ, all right? And that's what brings me to Romans chapter 8, verse 23, and hopefully you're already there. I'm going to read it to you. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All right, that, that word all, church, it means all, okay? That means every man, woman, boy, and girl, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, you may be here today and you may be thinking that, you well, you know what, Randy, you don't know me. You know, I'm a, I'm a decent person. I, you know, I've done some good things in my life. I, I, I've, I've accomplished some things throughout my life. I'm, I'm a good person. And you may feel like you're safe and secure in your, in your position with God. But can I tell you that that goes against everything that the Bible teaches in regards to salvation? That is a direct contradiction to the gospel. The word of God tells us that, that there are none righteous, no, not one. And, and the, James says in the book of James chapter 2 verse 10, he says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. And there's that word all again, church. And yes, that word all means all. Meaning that, listen, listen, if you attempt to try to keep every letter of the law, but you stumble in one little point of it, then you're guilty of it all, it says. So what does that do then toward to us? What will speak to us? Well, that tells us that, listen, there's nothing that we can do on our own to gain salvation. There's nothing. We can't earn God's favor. We can't do it through our works. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, you know, but listen, what does that leave us at then, church? Where does that leave us? Well, that brings me to my second point here. The second point is that sin has separated us. Yes, sin has separated us. And let me talk about that just for a moment. Sin has separated us from God. Can I tell you there's a disease that has plagued the earth? And that disease is sin. The Word of God teaches us that in the beginning when God created Adam and Eve and He placed them in the garden and His, his purpose and intentions were, them for, were for them to multiply, to take, you know, to, to care for the garden that He had left them with and, and to have dominion over all the animals, over all creation. But He said this one thing you cannot do. He said you can eat from any other tree in, 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 in the garden, but this one tree you cannot eat of. That is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But we know the story, right? We know that the serpent, right? Satan came and he tempted 
Eve. And he told her that surely, you, you know, she said, he, he, she said, I, we are not allowed. He said, are you not allowed to eat from any tree? And she said, she told him, no, it, we can eat from the trees, just not from this tree. Because God says if we eat from this tree, we will surely die. Right? And then the, then the serpent tempted her and said, no, listen, surely you will not die. But God just doesn't want you to be like him. But see, that's the struggle with man. And it has always been the struggle with man. Is, is man has always tried to elevate himself in the position of God. And when we try to earn our salvation through works and deeds, all we're doing is trying to elevate ourselves in a position where God belongs. But I don't need, it needs sin in the garden. At that moment, that time, sin entered in creation. And it tainted and it, and it, and it, and it cursed all the earth. And when we are born, we're born into that sin nature. You and I have that within us. And God, God is dealing with that sin nature within us through salvation. So yes, when sin has separated us from fellowship with God, because listen, God is holy. The Word of God gives a description of, of God. And it says that God is light and in Him there is no darkness. And the Word of God tells us, Tells us that sin is darkness. Listen, sin cannot be in the presence of God because He is a holy God. And this, and this is the hard part here, church. That sin has separated us from fellowship with God. That means that, listen, we can't enter on our own into the presence of God because He is a holy God and we are sinful man. And we have been eternally separated from God because of sin. So yes, sin has separated us from God, from fellowship with God. But can I tell you that it has not separated us from His love. And that brings me to our second verse this morning, which is Romans chapter 5, verse 8. The Apostle Paul writes here, he says, but God, and if you have a highlight or a pen, I want you to just highlight but God for a moment, please. It says, but God demonstrated his love towards us. And can I tell you that is perfect love? He demonstrated his love toward us, towards us that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I had you highlight but God because listen, it's but God, Okay. But God, we are eternally separated from God because of sin. And we have that inherited that sinful nature. But God. But God demonstrated. Demonstrated to us. God demonstrated his love towards us, he says. And can I tell you that that word love, what it means in the, in, in, in the Greek, that word for love in this context is agape. And agape means selfless, <laughs> unconditional love. Uh, unconditional church. That means that there's no uh, conditions to it, okay? That, is, that means that, listen, there's nothing that we can do to earn that love. God loves us. It tells us in the book of, <laughs> the book of 1 John, that it's not that we love God, but that He first loved us. Can I tell you that that first goes all the way back to the foundation all the way back to the beginning, God has always loved His creation. He has always loved man. And can I tell you that it broke the heart of God. It breaks the heart of God when we, when we deny and we reject Him. It breaks His heart because of His love towards us. But that unconditional church, I mean that unconditional love church is, means that listen, there's nothing that you can do to make Him not love you. That's what that unconditional love is. There's no conditions attached to His love for us. It's unconditional. But it's, it goes even further and deeper than that here, church, because He says He demonstrated it for us. You know, it's one thing to say that you love someone, right? But to, be, to, put it, to demonstrate that love is a whole other thing. It says that God demonstrated His love towards us. Meaning that, listen, He put it into action. He, he gave us something to, 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 to point to to say that I know that God loves me because He did this. He says He demonstrated His love towards us. That yet, while what? 
Yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So though, yes, we've inherited that sinful nature and, and it's a plague that has, that has cursed the whole land. And, but yet God demonstrated His own love towards us that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, that's our hope, church. That's our hope for restoration. That's our hope for healing. And I tell you, that's the meat of the gospel right there. But God, not but man. I mean, Jesus, God didn't put any requirements on his love. He didn't put any conditions on it to say, listen, if you do this, if you do that, then listen, I will love you. He says, I love you unconditionally. And he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So that is the answer there, church, to that sin problem is that, listen, He died for your sins, that yet while you were still sinners, yet while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. So can I tell you, for a moment, I just want you to think just for a moment about the worst thing, worst thing that you have ever done in your life. Got a picture of it? Jesus died for that too. Jesus died for that too. For the worst of sins, His blood covers that. The Word of God tells us that in Hebrews that Jesus is our high priest. Okay? And when we think about the high priest, if you look at the old covenant, if you look at the old ceremonial laws and what the position of the high priest was, he stood as mediator between the, the people of Israel and between God, okay? He was the one that the people went to in order to get to God, in order to present their offerings to God. So the people would bring their offerings to the high priest, and the, one of the things that the high priest had to do is he had to prepare the sacrificial lamb for its sacrifice, okay? And he had to do it in a certain way, in a certain manner, and if he, if he missed one detail, then listen... He was ceremonial, unclean, to be able to walk in behind the veil into the, uh, the Shekinah glory of God. Behind the Holy of Hol uh, the veil that entered into the Holy of Holies. If he wasn't perfect himself with God. And it was the position of the high priest to then, then take that sacrificial offering and, and, and sacrifice it and then bring it into behind the veil into the Holy of Holies and then to sprinkle the blood over the Ark of the Covenant which was a symbol, right? The, the Ark of the Covenant, He would sprinkle it over the mercy seat. What is that mercy seat without His Christ? And that blood that is, it is a representation of Christ's blood shed for us for the remission of sins. That we are cleansed and washed in the blood of Jesus. And in Hebrews chapter 4, it tells us that Jesus is our high priest. But it says that we don't have a high priest that we cannot sympathize with because he was tempted in all ways just as we are, yet without sin. And it tells us that in Hebrews also that he was the perfect sacrifice, the once and for all sacrifice. That there is no more need for that ceremonial sacrificial system because Jesus fulfilled it all at the cross. So there's no more need to present. They did it year in and year out. So there's no more need for us to present, right, a sacrifice to God because uh, Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice for all sins. And when it says all sins, it means all sins, past, present, and future. Jesus died for those. And that's why we can come to God. Like it tells us to in, 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 in Hebrews, right? That we can come and we can confess our sins to Him. And He's faithful and He's just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Because listen, that grace account does not run dry. The Word of God teaches us that it's grace upon grace upon grace. But the Apostle Paul also tells us, he says, what, should we do? What, what do we do then? Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, certainly not. For how can those who have died to sin continue in it? Jesus is, is the answer to the sin problem that you and I have. Amen. He is the answer to that problem. 
And it's all about faith in Him. And though we were once separated from God because of sin, we can be reconciled to God through Christ Jesus. And that word reconciled, what that speaks to, church, is it speaks to like, listen, you, if, you're, if you have a dispute with a good friend of yours, man, and y'all and, and break off y'all's friendship for a while. But for something to happen, some reason y'all come back into agreement and y'all begin that friendship again, that means that y'all have reconciled. So when we have been reconciled to God, that means that that relationship has been restored. I want to read to you a passage of Scripture out of Colossians. It's not going to be up here. I just want to share this with you. But it's in Colossians chapter 1 if you want to turn there. In Colossians chapter 1 verses 21 and 22 it says this. It says, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. He says that, listen, that Jesus has come for the purpose and the intentions of what? To reconcile us because we were once enemies of God. Enemies of God. Why? Because, listen, of that sin nature. We were being led by that sin nature, but no longer do we walk in that nature if we're a new creation in Christ, but we walk in the Spirit of God, being led by Him, directed by Him. And the only way to please God is through Jesus. But that leads me to my third point here, church. Is that God did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We could not earn the favor of God. Because listen, God is, is holy, He's righteous, and He's a God of love, but He's also a just God. And He's not a man that He should lie. So listen, he, there had to be a payment then for that, for that sin debt that you and I have. There had to be a payment for it. It had, it had to, there had to be something to pay for that debt that you and I had because of sin in our lives. And here in, in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And can I just stop there just for a moment and talk to you a little bit about grace? See, grace is, is when you're given something that you did not earn or that you even deserve. That's what grace is. And God's grace is unmerited favor from Him. It's not something that we gained or that we've earned. It's being given to us by God. And He says... For by grace you, uh, you um, for for by grace you have been saved through faith, through faith, church. See, it's through faith. It's through belief. It's through receiving that finished, accomplished work of Christ Jesus at the cross of Calvary on our behalf. It's understanding that He made the payment for us, and it's paid in full. And we but need to. To receive Christ Jesus into our hearts, into our lives, to experience the fullness of that. But he says, through faith, and that not of yourself, right? It's not of us. We can't do it. I can't stress that enough to you. You can't do enough to earn that favor that God has given freely, as he says here. It is the gift of God. A gift is something, church, listen, a gift is something that is given freely, right? Right? I mean, I don't give gifts expecting anything in return. But he says it's a gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. Because listen, if it was a work of man, then we could say that man is something that we have accomplished, right? Hey, we could, that's something we could boast in. But it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Because listen, it's solely dependent on but God. It's solely dependent upon what He has done. Therefore, He deserves all the praise, all the honor, all the glory, all the recognition. Because can I tell you, church, that if it was dependent upon us and our works and our deeds, then listen, Christ would not have had to come to the cross. He would not have, have, have had to lay down His life 
for any reason because it would have been up to man to gain his salvation through works. But yet Jesus came to the cross of Calvary and he sacrificed his life for you and I so that we could have access through Christ to the Father. The Word of God teaches us that whenever Jesus had breathed his, breathed his last breath, when he had cried out his last words on the cross, when he cried out, My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Right when he said it was finished. It tells us that the foundations of the, tremble, uh, of the temple shook and the veil was torn. The, that veil that was the entrance into the Holy of Holies, which was that innermost place of the temple where the Shekinah glory of God was. That the veil of that temple was torn from the top of the, to the bottom. As a demonstration of God tearing it, tearing that veil, that, that separation between you and, and God. And it tells us that Jesus entered in behind the veil. That it's Jesus who went through the veil to be our mediator between us and God. The Bible says, but one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. A mediator is one who goes on our behalf. Jesus has gone on in our behalf into the presence of God. And Jesus says of himself, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one will enter into the Father, he, Father, he says, except through me. Through me. The only way that we can access the Father is through Christ Jesus. So for us to be reconciled, for us to have a right relationship with God the Father, it must be through Christ. And through Him alone. But he says here, it says here, and the next point I want to make is, where you were once enemies of God, now you can be called a child of God. Because that restoration is bringing us from a place of being separated from God as an enemy of God, is that when we reconcile with God, we are now children of God. We've been adopted, grafted into the family of God. But he says here in this in passage in John chapter 1, in the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 12, he says, But as many as received him, and that is not, listen, that is all, not just part, okay? That's a receiving all that He has done for you. To them, He gave the right to become children of God to those who believe. And, and that word means to commit unto, who, who believe in His name. And can I talk to you just for a moment about belief? Because, listen, I, I hear it all the time, church. I hear it all the time that, you know, I believe in God. I believe that there's a God. Can I tell you, it tells us in the book of James chapter 2, that he says, you believe in God, you believe that there's one God, you do well, he says. But the demons believe and tremble. See, it's more than just having a knowledge of God. It's about entering in through Christ Jesus. It's about receiving by faith His finished, accomplished work at the cross of Calvary. So what that means, church, is that, listen, we can't be, and it's a personal thing. It's a personal choice that we make to follow Christ, to give our hearts and our lives to Him. That means we can't be dependent right upon anybody else's salvation. We can't be dependent upon our parents' faith, right? Or our grandparents' faith, or our great-grandparents' faith. We have to be dependent upon that decision, that choice to come to Jesus Christ through faith. To believe, but not only believe, but to commit ourselves unto that belief. That, that means we give ourselves over to it. And I tell you that that kind of belief changes the heart of, a, of, of an individual. Because that's what Jesus' is, is, is purpose is. That's what God's purpose is in our redemption. Is He's redeeming us from sin. And, 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 he's, and He's taking care of that sin nature. right? Because it's no longer based on our righteousness, but it's based on the righteousness of Christ. Imputed righteousness. That means that God, through Christ Jesus, has put in our account righteousness. And it's the righteousness of Christ. Because He is the perfect sacrificial lamb that died for the sins of the world. That it's through Him and by Him and Him only. But he is, he, His purpose and intention is to restore us. That we are, when Jesus says, he says that if any man, I mean the, the, the Bible says, John Paul says, he says, if any man is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. 
The old has passed away. Behold, all things are new. The moment of our confession of faith, we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The moment. Now there's a process that we go through throughout our walk. We're going to look at that as we go on in this journey. And that process is a process of sanctification where we're being made new every day, okay? We're dying to that old nature and we're becoming more like Christ Jesus in character. But he's dealing with that sin issue, church. And can I tell you, he has dealt with that sin issue? He has dealt with it at the cross. Amen. He finished. When Jesus said it is finished, he meant it is finished. It is done. God has provided every way necessary for us to enter into a personal relationship through him, to him, in, with him, through Christ. And we enter in by faith. We enter in by faith, and, and we can't depend, be, dependent, be dependent upon anybody else's faith. It, it has to be our faith. We have to make the personal decision to say yes to God, to make Jesus Christ Lord of our lives. And, and can I tell you what that means? Is when we make Him Lord of our lives, that means He becomes Lord of our lives, church. Lord of our lives. That means that, listen, we, we step off the throne of our lives and we, and we put Jesus on the throne of our lives. We give Him that rightful place in our lives as Lord of our lives. That means that we're submitting unto Him all the control. And we're giving it all to Him. That we're relying and dependent upon Him and His, and His continued Pouring out of grace and mercy. Because listen, we all fall short. All of us do. And thank God for grace. Thank God for grace. But our salvation is not dependent upon us, church. It's dependent upon Christ and He has accomplished it. We but need to enter in by faith. And it's more than just having a head knowledge of, of, of God or just a... Uh, you know, just a belief that there is a God. It's not a matter of, is, is there a God? Is He your God? Have you made Him Lord of your life? Have you surrendered your all and all to Him and given Him your life? That is the question today, church. Where do you find yourself in those categories that I told you about earlier? Do you have that confident assurance in your salvation? I do. I know where I'm going. Do you find yourself in this position where you feel like your toes have been stepped on a little bit today? And because this doesn't line up with what you thought was the plan of salvation... Did you think that just because you were a good person that you were secure? Or are you that person that is here in the, God's plan of salvation for the first time and, and thinking to yourself, you know what? I need, to, I need to get my heart right with God today. Is that you? My prayer is that if you fall into those categories this morning, that listen, no matter where you're at, you will respond to God. Jesus says that no one comes to me unless the Father who has sent me draws them. If the Holy Spirit has ministered and spoke to your heart in any way today, in regards to salvation, my prayer is that you will make a choice today to follow Him. Make a choice to make Him Lord of your life. He's but a confession of faith away. Can I tell you that the fact, church, that we, that we cannot earn our salvation is good news for us? To know that Christ has accomplished it all at the cross and through His, burial, His death, burial, and resurrection. And that He is our mediator between us and God. That is good news, church. That is something that we should rejoice over to this morning. He is the source of our salvation. And it's only through Him. Would you please stand for me this morning as we go into 
invitation. And you know, I told Nikki this morning, I was up here this morning and praying about today's sermon because this is the meat of the gospel church. This is the meat of it. And I, and I told her I felt like I was just going through a spiritual battle. Like, man, it was just everywhere I turned, man, I was, I was finding resistance. And, and I tell you, it's because the, the devil don't want you to hear this. The devil don't want you to hear the plan of salvation. Because if he can cloud your judgment on it, then listen, he's got you right where he wants you. If he can distort your opinion on it, then he's got you right where he wants you. If he can harden your heart towards it, then he's got you right where he wants you. Can I tell you that God's plan today? The Word of God tells us that today is the day of salvation. Today is that day. And we don't know what tomorrow holds. Make the choice today to follow the Lord, to, to make Him Lord of your life. To give Him that position in your heart as being Lord of your life. Would you come this morning? Listen, the altar's open. If you want to pray, listen, I'll pray with you this morning. I just want to encourage you that where you are at right now, get along with the Lord. Seek His heart for you. Ask Him to search your heart this morning. I promise you, if you do that, He will. He may show you some ugly things in your life, but it's only for the purpose of you laying it down. And that's it. What will your choice be this morning? The invitation's over. Cody's going to play for this song. Be standing off to the side just like I do every Sunday. And if you want me to pray with you, if you have some questions, if you want to discuss some things, listen, let's talk. I'll take the time to do it. And at this time, I just pray that, that you will respond to whatever God is putting on your heart this morning. Would you come this morning?
For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even die. But God showed his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him for the wrath of God? Chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we, we who have died to sin still live in it? Be justified means that we've been made right with God. Alright, and that justification only comes by faith is what the Bible teaches us. Only by faith. We're not justified in and of ourselves and what we can gain and do. We're justified by faith and what God and what Christ has done for us. It was brought to my attention, and a young lady shared with me that she feels like there's somebody here that's struggling this morning, struggling with a with depression or something. And I just want to pray, if any of you are struggling with anything this morning, I, I, I want to tell you that the answer is in Christ Jesus. That you can find healing for that this morning here and, and in the presence of God. He can bring healing to that this morning. If you're struggling in any way, would you come and bring it before the altar this morning, lay it down at the foot of the cross and give it over to God. That's the only place you're going to find your peace because He is our Prince of Peace. I'm going to give just a moment longer. If you don't want to stand, you don't have to. I'm going to give a moment longer. And if you would, I would ask you all to bow your heads right now. Just bow your heads. This is private. The invitation is still open. And if you feel like God is tugging on your heart, then listen, come.
Listen, our walk with the Lord is a journey, okay? But it's a journey worth taking. And it comes a great reward. I just pray that, you know, my, my prayer is that you'll enter in on that journey with me, okay? Okay, so we're going to talk for the next several weeks about this journey that we are on, okay? All right, well, that's...